Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Scorpio New Moon webinar of the 2025 initiative. Today, we gather to continue our rhythmical work focusing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. Thank you for joining our circle. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Alexander. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. And we will just take a moment now to refresh our purpose in this work as we reread re re our statement of vision and purpose. We gather once a month at the new moon to focus on a shared vision for the common good that is expressed through the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We participate in group meditation on these formulated thought forms of solution that address the issues facing humanity and the planet at this time. These SDG thought forms help to create physical conditions leading to transformation and elevation of human consciousness. Through this meditation, we energize and magnetize the vision to be radiatory and to reach as many people as possible in order that the sustainable development goals might manifest through many actions. We use the opportunity of the new moon cycles and available astrological energies to distribute, radiate and anchor intention on the physical plane. As we sound this note of shared vision through our discussion and meditation work, we support the vibrant activation, consolidation and spread of the will to good throughout humanity. And over to Dot now as we join in the naming circle to begin our alignment. Thank you, Rebecca. In the naming circle, we are uniting hearts across distance as we begin our alignment and bring ourselves fully into this group work, together and as a group. In uniting our hearts in this way, we begin naturally to work telepathically through our group mind. The key to this telepathic work is in the etheric alignment, which creates the group field and allows it to become a receiving and transmitting agent for higher ideas and energies. So I will say each name and at that time, please unmute yourself and say your full name and where you are calling in from. Dot Maver calling in from New Jersey in the USA. And then I will welcome you into, into the circle and then go on to the next. So let us begin with the organizers and then attendees. So you can follow the list. Daniela. Hello everyone, Daniela Nestorovic. I'm calling in from Brussels, Belgium. Welcome Daniela. James. Hello everyone, uh, it's James Mills from London. Welcome James. Maria Cristina. Maria Cristina Donadiu, the Arizona Sonora Desert in the USA. Welcome, Maria Cristina. Martha. Welcome, Martha. Rebecca. Oh, there she is. Martha. Martha Gallagher from New York City. Hello, everyone. 
Welcome, Martha. Rebecca. Rebecca Hood from Queensland, Australia. Hello. Welcome, Rebecca. Alexander. Alexander Ichu from New York City. Welcome, Alexander. Annette, Annette Ebbett. From South Island, New Zealand. Welcome, Annette. Annette Loeffler. Hello, this is Annette Loeffler from Soho, Denmark. Welcome, Annette. Antoinette. Hello, it's Antoinette de Toy, and I'm from South Africa. Welcome, Antoinette. Avon. Welcome, Avon. Carl. Hello, hello. Uh, I'm from France. <laughs> I am Muriela, in fact. Muriela. Welcome, Maria. Yeah. Thanks. Cheryl. Welcome, Cheryl. Christine. Hello, world. Christine Moore in Michigan, USA. Welcome, Christine. Deborah. Deborah Barto from Seattle, Washington, USA. Welcome, Deborah. Jan. Welcome, Jan. Judy. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Judy Harrison from Brewster, Massachusetts, USA. Welcome, Judy. Karen, Karen Gendry. This is Karen from Southern Oregon, USA. Welcome, Karen. Karen Gritska. This is Karen Gritska from Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Karen. Lerner. Hello everyone, it's Lunen Rebecca from Denmark. Welcome, Lynn. Lynn Murguia, Tucson, Arizona, USA. Welcome, Lynn. Maylie. Hello, this is Miley Anderson from Sweden. Welcome, Miley. Not me. Natalie Talker from Nelson, New Zealand. Welcome, Natalie. Richard. Richard Hood, Sunshine Coast, Australia. Welcome, Richard. Robin. Welcome, Robin. Roswita. Welcome, Roswita. Sheldon. Alexander, are we okay with the unmuting? Uh, yes, Sheldon, is, uh, you are muted on your end. Welcome, Sheldon. Silvana. Welcome, Silvana. Stacia. Hello, this is Stacia Hipkins from Phoenix, Arizona, USA. Welcome, Stacia. And Silvana? Greetings, everyone. It's Silvana from Melbourne, Australia. Welcome, Silvana. Suzanne. Welcome, Suzanne. Tanya, oh, Suzanne. Uh, sorry, hello, this is Suzanne Maloney from Melbourne, Australia. Welcome, Suzanne. Tanya. 
Hello, uh, this is Tanya Belfort from Salvador, Bahia, Brazil. Welcome, Tanya. Tina. Hello, this is Tina Hutchings from Denver, Colorado, USA. Welcome, Tina. Zenaida. Welcome, Zenaida. And over to you, Martha. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dot. <clears throat> now that we've heard everyone's voices, let us begin a pattern of breathing that both meets the needs of the physical body, but brings us together into the one etheric field that we all share. The new moon period follows upon the cycle of outbreathing. It's a moment of pause before we begin the inbreathing. It is a time where together we can establish a soul, mind, brain alignment. It is a time to gather seed thoughts. See thoughts that can be turned into practical action. A time where we can enhance the many ways the power of the one life and the love of the one soul together are working out through all of us and all true servers everywhere. Mm -hmm. Let us find the silence in the deep flame of our souls. The human soul is a synthesis of material energy qualified by intelligent consciousness. Added to that is the spiritual energy colored by every ray type we represent. DK offers a wonderful image, which we might use here now. When the right hand holds the golden lotus firm and the left hand grasps the flower of life, man finds himself to be the seven-leaved plant which flowers on earth and flowers before the throne of God. From Esoteric Psychology, page 61. D.K. says in the reappearance of the Christ that the Christ had a great deal to do with the formation of the United Nations in 1945. And so when we take our stand on behalf of the greatest collective enterprise that humans have ever tried, we stand in the space that Christ has called us to. It 
It is not one that will be achieved by desire. Rather, the gathering and the sharing of the good ideas that activate each of us according to our own sense of purpose. So let us say together, in the center of the will of God, I stand. Naught shall deflect my will from his. I work out that will by love. I, the triangle divine, work out that will within the square. and serve my fellow men. Thank you, Martha. And thank you each and every one as together and with massed intent, we unitedly work. Through our annual zodiacal liturgy, we traverse through the challenges and opportunities offered by the 12 lives of the constellations. A progression may be noted in this yearly cycle, a cyclic progression. In the recent days of Libra, we were offered a momentary pause, an interlude, we sounded the signature keynote of the soul. We choose the way between the two great lines of force, dedicating ourselves anew to our higher spiritual possibilities. Poised at a point of spiritual tension, asserting our spiritual intent. Here we garner our strength, taking a stance as the inner self, entering the path of return an opportunity and a happening as we astrologically step from the mutable cross onto the fixed cross, experiencing what might be called the reversal of the wheel. Libra enables humanity as a whole to weigh its values. This annual cycle is depicted in the 12 labors of Hercules, the world disciple. We are now entering the testing times of Scorpio, said to be the sign of aspirant and of discipleship. In Scorpio, we enter the purificatory burning grounds wherein our resolve and understanding are tested and endure trials which will ultimately lead to triumph. The 12 labors of Hercules associated with the 12 signs of the zodiac, depict the 12 gates through which each of us must pass on the path of return as individuals, as group, and as humanity. In the ninth labor, in the ninth sign of Scorpio, Hercules must battle a loathsome many-headed beast. He must engage in battle with a nine-headed hydra, many heads of the hydra representing the glamours and illusions which must be overcome. The hook depicted in the glyph of Scorpio may give a clue to the accomplishment of the challenge. The glamours and illusions of the dweller are not overcome through battling directly with the hydra. After battling with the hydra, Hercules finally triumphs by kneeling, entering and reaching into the depths of the unconscious with Pluto's aid. Here we traverse the purificatory burning ground of the unconscious until through testing and trial, lift the hydra's heads increasingly into the dissipating light of day. An approach perhaps indicated 
by the arrowhead found on the dipping hook of the Scorpio glyph. The phoenix rises from the ashes, and together we may sing the keynote of Scorpio, warriors are we, and from the battle we emerge triumphant. We, we may then clearly see the next step ahead, directing our sights in Sagittarius, focusing our gaze, directing our arrow with one pointed intent toward the mountaintop of Capricorn. A time of much manifestation, for we will find Pluto, Saturn, and Jupiter in Capricorn this coming time of Capricorn. As disciples, we are freed into the consciousness of group life and of group service. But first, the dissipation of glamour and the dispelling of illusion must be accomplished. On the fixed cross, Scorpio is to be found in polarity with Taurus, its opposing sign. Traditionally, Taurus is aligned with personal resources. As Scorpio interacts with its polar opposite, the foundation of material values built in Taurus becomes a consideration of resources in relation to others, business contracts, organizational organizations, communal relationships on, very con on the very concrete planes, you might say. And it is in this contextual light of these relationships, this communal life, that we may enter into a consideration of today's topic cities and the many relationships inherent in this group experiment an externalization of the group life of humanity martha Martha, please unmute yourself. Uh, I'm unable to read the goals. Perhaps James can help me out here. Um, I think the goals have been um, deleted in the previous uh, version of the... Uh, of the um... Goal 2. Oh, 11. Goal 11 making cities and all human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Sustainable goal number 11. Can you read the targets as well, Maria Cristina? No need, Martha, no time. It, um, you may not have gotten the latest version we are at the stage where numerous initiatives all over the planet are testing out models of sustainable city living in all its complex aspects under the pressure of rapid urbanization and climate change. Are you there, Martha? I'm here, Maria. I see the first uh, slide of sustainable cities and communities. We would like to share a glimpse into the current situation of the diverse cities to be found around the world and glimpse the plans of one architectural firm considering how to design cities of the future as well. Countless men and women of goodwill are to be found working throughout the planet. Some are first responders, so to speak men and women of goodwill responding to the immediate situation, responding to the current and increasingly critical situation of today's world. And we would also like to envision the cities of the future. Biomorphic urbanism is a term used by an architectural urban planning firm in the designs recently highlighted 
in a recent issue of National Geographic on cities of the future. Their vision incorporates 10 key principles. First, the ecology. The development and infrastructure complement and are shaped by the ecology, letting nature regenerate and support rapidly growing urban populations. Built around natural features and forces, protecting wildlife habitat and natural resources, the city is compact, based on a unified vision for the region and dense to limit impacts on the ecosystem. Secondly, water. Sources are protected and systems designed to capture, treat, and reuse it. Water increasingly becomes a resource to produce energy. Landfill and industrial lab areas are rehabilitated, upland water systems protected, wetland restoration, restoration and sponge city measure revive habitats, protect against flooding and sea level rise. Today, many cities are flooding. Many are sinking, the most notable being Jakarta, where the Indonesian government is in the process of building a new city to be completed in five years in Borneo. Many sponge cities that absorb, cleanse, and use rainfall are already using these techniques with China leading the way 30 Chinese cities will receive 400 to 405 million RMBs each. The pilot green roofs construct wetlands, increase tree cover, and permeable pavements to capture, slow down, and filter stormwater. Third, energy is renewable and the city becomes more livable. In the cities of the future, energy will be 100% renewable. Solar panels incorporated onto all the surfaces of the building's facade capture the sun energy with data collection devices embedded. Interestingly, Dubai has declared the potential of solar energy as their new frontier. And thanks to its one-person rule, his Highness, the Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Ak Maktoum, has decreed that Dubai will shift to clean energy resources. He wants to have the smallest carbon footprint in the world. <laughs> Four, waste becomes a resource to produce energy. More than half of the world's population 4.5 billion people continue to live without access to safely managed sanitation. In many cities in the global south, more than 50% of human waste escapes into the environment untreated. In 2011, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation instituted funding for research to address this concern. And last year, 2018, the Reinvented Toilet Expo showcased radically new decentralized sanitation technologies and products that eliminate har harmful pathogens and convert waste into byproducts like clean water and fertilizer. You see Bill Gates there holding a bottle of poop. These are going to be available without the infrastructure, the traditional infrastructure. Development and please Google <laughs> development finance institutes at the ex, this expo, including the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and the African Development Bank, announced commitments with the potential to unlock $2.5 billion in financing. Five chains. So five is um, food grown locally and sustainably. 
sustainability practices are mandated across the life cycle of a product from food, food production to delivery and disposal. Global standards are established for organic farming and animal treatment produced locally. Crops can be planted vertically, bringing people food closer together, reducing transport costs and emissions. A wide variety of vertical garden towers are increasingly available for indoor gardens. Six, high speed rail improves mobility. Traveling in the city of the future is more affordable, safe and convenient because of the automated technology and high speed rail. Fewer pe personal automobiles and more pedestrian space is available. In Curitiba in Brazil, there is a very successful bus rapid transport system which has boosted the quality of urban life for all residents. Many cities in the developing world are following this example. Seven, culture and heritage are publicly supported. In the densely populated and diverse city of the future, historical heritage is preserved and celebrated. Cultural festivals and venues are supported even as recreation, arts and entertainment are shared globally through the virtual and augmented through virtual and augmented reality. Eight, livability, a culturally determined consideration. The city of the future is designed for accessibility and safety as more people populate urban areas. Residents have healthier lives with more streamlined access to nature services and automated technology. This is a cross-section drawing through a theoretical city in the developing world. Um, the diagram attempts to show how two cities, one developing and one developed, can coexist in one whole within the framework of shared responsibilities. On the periphery, the newcomers arrive, the migrants from the countryside who are housed in simple, low-level houses which will require land reform policies to allow ownership uh, by, by rural migrants as part of the city government's policy. As we move into the centre of the city, we see the more complex three, four and five-storey buildings forming suburbs with green spaces in close proximity to the central city. In the central zone, we have high-rise buildings and this environment gives us the smart city where the inhabitants use technology to create an efficient, very low carbon environment. Nine, infrastructure is carbon neutral. Buildings are constructed more efficiently and include technologies that can improve the quality of natural resources such as water, soil and air. Bioluminescent material captures sunlight and illuminates infrastructures and buildings with natural light. Efficient materials such as stretchable steel accelerate construction times and reduce buildings' carbon footprints. This image uh, shows the Eastgate shopping centre in Harare, Zimbabwe, which is based on a naturally ventilated termite mound. Infrastructure is designed for pedestrian access with lifted roads for cars, Water, water filtration, environmental monitoring and native landscaping are part of the streetscape. An inspiring initiative which promises to produce good results in the field of sustainable housing within the developing world is run by the United Nations Habitat Agency formed at the 5th UN Urban Forum, Con um, Forum in 2010 called the Global Initiative for Incremental Housing. This image shows how a house can develop over time according to the resources of and needs of the inhabitants. This is a global network of approximately 22 universities in association with Habitat International to support this strategy for meeting the needs of an exploding third world city growth. Their goal is to build global awareness of the incremental alternative, drawing on experiences from the 1970s and the demonstrated abilities of the expanding informal sector in Asia, Africa and Latin America. 10. The economy is largely automated and online. 
the economy of the future of the future city must work in tandem with policies that safeguard eco ecological sustainability. People adapt to more flexible working hours as artificial, artificial intelligence and automation become more widespread. An economic system that is sustainable, such as the donut model as pioneered by Kate Rayworth, would promote the sharing of resources and a sense of community amongst all city residents. So over to you, Martha, for the conclusion. Martha, please unmute yourself. James? Yes. Martha? Might uh, you read? Yes, I can read it. Shall I read it? Okay, so in conclusion, the Master Dwaj Kool writes in Cosmic Fire, and then the second characteristic of Manus, a very interesting development may be looked for during the coming century. This is the intensification of business organization and the bringing under law and order of the entire life of families and groups of families, cities and groups of cities, nations and groups of nations. Until the human race in every department of its exoteric life will conform to rule, this voluntarily and with monastic realization of group need, many interesting events will occur and many experiments will necessarily be made some to prove successful and some failures before manus or purposeful ordered intelligent activity will control in the life of the peoples of this world Unquote. many interesting events are occurring and there are many experiments now underway by servers around the world who are responding to the needs of today's world the development of sustainable cities requires vision, clear thinking, education, long-term planning and imagination, right relationships between individual inhabitants and communities, an attitude of goodwill and a sharing economy are fundamental to this need. Over to you, Christina. And so, we enter into our collective work, deepening our alignment, aligned, visualizing the Antikarana Bridge, the lighted path of energy communication between the spiritual triad and the soul-infused group personality. Visualizing our group centers, spiritual workers, taking a unified breath, aligning within the group field of the Great Mother. As spiritual workers, we stand Hearts uniting through the dynamic magnetic force of the soul. And we work from preparation to implementation. Extending our group light to illuminate and participate in the loving heart of Gaia. 
the great mother that is ever present in the one life. Bridging, we hold our consciousness, focusing on Mother Earth with all the present challenges, the great David Mother, and see the sustainable development goals a blueprint that countries have agreed upon, nations, countries, the vision for the United Nations for global humanity. Manifesting. Manifesting through these goals, through the group of nations. We focus our attention on group, on goal 11, that of sustainable living cities. and enter into the power of silence, pausing. Registering our impressions, realize the livingness of no one left behind. Building our resilience throughout the world. Anchoring this visionary thought form and this redistribute the energy gathered, sounding the first mantra of the great invocations 
followed by the one we know and love. Let the forces of light bring illumination to mankind. Let the spirit of peace be spread abroad. May all of goodwill everywhere meet in a spirit of cooperation. May forgiveness on the part of all be the keynote at this time. Let power attend the efforts of the great ones. So let it be and help us to do our part. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into human minds. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into human hearts. May the coming one, the Lord Maitreya, return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide little human wills. The purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call humanity, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Thank you. So thank you so much to our presenters. And now's the time when we come to the discussion section of the webinar. And I'm just wondering, um, I see that you're unmuted now, Martha, and there was a bit of a trouble with your microphone earlier. And I'm just wondering whether you would like to um, seed in some thoughts to dis begin the discussion and maybe some of the things you didn't get to mention earlier. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, first of all, uh, 
please accept my apologies. The um, internet was was uh, precarious where I am at the present moment, and I was hearing, but I couldn't retrieve my unmute. So I appreciate those who filled in the dots for me. Um, I had wanted to offer a reflection on how deeply moved I was <clears throat> to uh, have the uh, particular form of the meditation um, that is being offered now in the New Moon webinars. And I would invite the coordinating uh, group to tell me a little bit more about that. But may I make just a couple of opening remarks that so often um, at the United Nations, we there's a tremendous uh, conflict between individual egos, self-interest of countries, and that kind of thing. And that I have always felt that with the millennium, one of the incursions that came was the opening of the Indigenous Peoples Forum and the recognition of Mother Earth for uh, those who are, um, grew up in Roman Catholicism. I'm not certain if you r recall that that was considered a heresy, that term, because it interfered with the Church's understanding of the patriarchal Father God. And certain basic thought forms are imploding uh, before our eyes, which I see as certainly the uh, expression of a platonic sensibility happening. But the, but the larger point here is, is that, as we know, all that which we know is all that is, has no gender, and that it's we humans who live in duality, and it's we humans who try to achieve a balance. And so I personally feel very grateful that uh, there is a shifting of the tone, I presume, in the interests of balance, um, but that is very consistent with the transformation of achievement in relation to what the UN has set its task about, which is the harmony among nations. So perhaps maybe one of the coordinating uh, folk, uh, triangle could speak to uh, your understanding of the shift in that uh, meditation and, and give us even more clarity. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. And um, I would like to invite Dot to respond um, because it was actually, and possibly Alexander, because the con the formation of that um, meditation form occurred um, when they were in Italy together earlier this year, visiting the community of living ethics. And I just also want to remind everyone that at um, you know, all participants who are online, um, that um, this is a time when you are so welcome to contribute. We would love to hear from you as well. Um, so please um, use the, the hand icon to raise your hand um, and Alexander will unmute you and you can ask a question or you can type into the questions or the chat box. Um, and, um, Alexander will read out your comments or questions or, or yes, Alexander will, I think. Um, so yes, just wanted to remind about that. So um, it's over to you, Dot, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Martha, for bringing this into the circle as we continue this experiment uh, with the New Moon webinars and creating more and more of a group rhythm. And yes, when we were in Italy, and it was uh, actually during the Planet Within conference at the Community of Living Ethics, 
um, and I'll speak for myself, and then Alexander can share, was very inspired um, by Marco's talk about the United Nations and the Sustainable Development Goals, and him tying this, I mean, it's the first time, we, we all know this, that all countries have said yes to a global plan that were it to be implemented at the local levels, would be and is just amazing, which is why why we are so focused on these stimulus sharings as well, giving examples and talking about what we are actually experiencing in manifestation. Tied to the uh, first point of the Charter of the United Nations, where there are four ABCD, four points within that, the first three are to-dos you know, like deal with all the conditions on earth and uh, nations should work together in cooperation and all this. But the fourth one actually does, Martha, as you well know, speak to harmonization of the nations to work together in order to achieve the first three, the economic development for everybody and cooperation and peace on earth, et cetera. That really touched us. And so we decided that we also at the same time needed a bit more of an actual focus through our monthly meditations on the specific goal within the SDGs so that we would use the power of our group mind as we have united our hearts across distance, we're working, pulsing rhythmically as a group that we would actually create that thought form very deliberately. So tying all that together, and of course the great mother Gaia, when we stand as a planetary server in group, within the consciousness of Gaia herself, we are, I mean, we are the planet. We are not just a part of we then represent. And so it, it, we felt that it would give it more power uh, and we can feel this experiment taking on its own rhythm. So looking forward to hearing from others as well. And Alexander, perhaps you wish to comment as well. Yeah, not much I can add to what you just said, but, and This work is a continuous experiment, and uh, one of the inspiring principles of, for this work is uh, it's our discipleship responsibility to modify, qualify, and adapt the plan. So the plan is not imposed. So it's ongoing meditation on what is unfolding, and I think we all been recognizing in the recent years and the recent decades this unfoldment of the recognition of the mother principle and even more to that is unfoldment of the recognition of our planet mother earth as our common habitat that brings us all together and uh, the sustainable development goals there all built around the idea of harmonious relations with the Mother Earth and between humanity and the Earth. And so that's recognition of that is being reflected in this uh, meditation. And I want to mm, bring the focus to, to the uh, goal uh, 11 and uh, I really appreciate uh, today's presentation. It's been very clearly outlined vision and I really appreciate that. That's, that's those steps that you, your triangle presented in your presentation um, can be used just as a visualization. Yes. I d wasn't clear if um, there are other questions, and please set this one aside. 
if there are other questions. But I wanted to also raise, uh, James, you brought up the UN Habitat when you mentioned the Global Initiative for Incremental Housing uh, in, that uh, was stimulated 2010 at the World Forum on in the UN Habitat. Um, I, I wanted to just throw a little light onto you too for bringing that up because in the course of the uh, work on the SDGs, that particular sector does not get a lot of attention and yet it, it speaks so directly to a lot of the humanitarian envisioning. And I wondered if you would like to speak a little bit more on your own experience as an architect and um, what your own thoughts are in terms of the, the, the notion of cities, not only in the future, but what you're seeing now. Um, James, I think you might be muted. Let's unmute you. Or are you on? Yes, there you are. <laughs> Relief. Relief. We can hear you now. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, it's interesting. Thank you, uh, Martha, for uh, asking me. I, I grew up in South Africa um, and I went to in Durban, in uh, KwaZulu-Natal, and all through my childhood and through my university years, there was this constant debate about housing, development, apartheid, you know, uh, it, it, and the fact that um, there need to be very practical solutions to involve people from who, who have very little who um who who basically are looking for shelter um all the way through the kind of social groups all the way up to the the first world um uh, groups of people who live in a country like south africa and you see it all over the developing world how there's this huge um uh what do i call it like a spectrum of needs in terms of a uh, city provision and um and, and therefore, this this initiative of incremental housing seemed to me like a really practical um, approach where you start off with a very basic plan, maybe one or two rooms, and you, uh, as time goes on, you're able to um, build more and and more densely, and you can see perhaps the idea you have in India, uh, the Indians um, have developed this quite a lot where they're developing towns from very basic building uh, site, site, what they call site and service schemes and how villages and towns can be developed into proper cities or, or kind of small satellite towns on the edges of cities. Um, and, and, you know, places like India and places like South Africa who have the resources um, in the first world as well as in the developing world to 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 address these issues um, which are going to become more and more c critical as time goes on and in Brazil as well I, I, I spent some time in Rio de Janeiro and there is an amazing amount going on in Brazil um, in terms of their uh, ability to tackle um, poverty housing and and technology and how you mediate between you know the very poor and 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 the, and the very wealthy um so i i think it, it's still patchy if you look at it globally but um uh, there are there are many projects and many institutes i think that reach out um globally through the internet um which are trying to draw uh, together like this incremental housing initiative that are trying to draw together expertise so that there is a more coordinated uh, approach to um to to housing in in the developing world which which is becoming a, a really critical issue at the moment and especially with climate change and all the infrastructural uh development that's needed uh to to mitigate the problems with with uh, the changing climate um yeah, so that's probably, I can say more, but that's <laughs> probably enough for now. Uh. 
Thank you, James and Martha. And um, we do have a raised hand. Um, Christine Moore has her hand raised. Um, hello. Uh, hello, Christine. I do appreciate every comment that's been made. I actually would like to give my personal perspective of when. Um, as I look out 20 years, my generation will be gone. My children's generation will probably not accept these ideas yet. But then I have a 20 year old granddaughter who will move into this technology and this new structure for living very easily. I look at those who are resisting this plan. They feel that they, at this point, are being asked to give up their personal property. Those of you who are living in New York City, I would find very sterile. I have a beautiful yard, not very large, but I have large imposing trees, which I am prepared to pay to have them trimmed. So at this point, I'm not willing to go into any more of a dense community than I'm already in. But again, if I am fortunate enough to live into my hundreds, <laughs> I won't have any other choice. Do you understand where I'm going here? There are people in California who have lost their homes and that land is being segregated out from further development. It is, paradise is lost. Those homes will really not be replaced. So I need some kind of perspective for easing in to those who are living in a linear timeline as opposed to this vision, which of course is circular. Thank you. So um, this is Martha, Christine, and I um, love your image of the tree and how much comfort it gives. And uh, would also add to that the air that you can breathe. I'm not sure that I can, uh, I, I think maybe where it may be really difficult uh, in trying to describe a transition is the ease part. I don't actually see an easing into the changes that are ahead of us. Uh, James, I, also, I was just in Rio and wanted to confirm what you said, that the cities that, and Jakarta would be another one, the, the, the cities that seem to be having the worst stress, Rio has 40% poor within its location, and it has to um, work to bring that together with those who have a lot. The... Um, the fact is, is that the best ideas seem to be coming from the places that have the greatest problems. That there's something in human nature that doesn't sort of sit down and imagine in the space of ease. Rather, it seems to be that, that uh, what DK said is the burning ground is where the change will be made. But what I see for myself, since you and I sound like we may be of the same generation, what I try to take on is uh, what I can do. I, I know that those who do not live in the kind of density that exists in New York City um, can compost. And I, I love when I visit my daughter, who has a big important job, we don't talk about her big important job, we talk about her worms and how they uh, are making the soil that she can come home to and, and grow things. So I would say 
all of us probably need to get on board, regardless of what generation we're in, as we can. And um, that what we will find is, is that everybody doing their part actually will make a difference. So I, I would just advise that just because we are of a certain age and require certain levels of living that we not rule ourselves out in terms of contributing to what's ahead of us. And I would just add that not just what's ahead of us, but that time is now, the times that we are living. And to realize that we are in a time of unknown steps by the very nature of the times we are told, which are initiatory times. Revelation is part of what we must be receptive to because it must be, by definition, a little bit unknown. See that Tanya has her, her hand up. And, and also there's a question from Stacia as well after Tanya has spoken. Hello everybody. It's an honor and joy to be here with you all. Of course, I have um, sincere intention and uh, pray that uh, the sustainable goals work out. But also I have a lot of doubts and questions when we see these figures that 90% uh, of urban expansion will be in the developing world. So what is going to happen to South America? And um, it seems like uh, the goals do not actually reflect the problems we are having in the forest or the um, control of the narco traffic in all South American countries. I want to thank James for the nice comments that he made about Rio, but living in Brazil and in a city called Bahia, which has 80% Afro-descendants, that uh, to reach this consciousness of um, how to live in harmony, it's becoming each day worse. And uh, remind everybody that technology has a high cost for us in such a way that uh, most Brazilians now do not have computers anymore. They're using cell phones. Um, and I also, so I would like to ask all of you to include Brazil in your prayers, because in my personal way of view, the forest does not belong to Brazil, the Amazon forest, but it belongs to the world. And uh, if we think and develop this consciousness, we can become, become guardians of the forest, not forgetting that uh, we have thousands and thousands of sentient beings, lives, animal lives, and um, living in this area. Uh, also, um, we have to talk and discuss something that's very uneasy, which is the developed countries coming into Brazil and South America and continue taking our resources, our minerals, and we had several disasters in this year, the latest one two weeks ago, and thousands and thousands of petroleum was spilled in uh, Brazilian beaches. The first and the worst um, water um, disaster, and um, with no solution. We don't know who did it. Uh, it was spilled from the international waters. So uh, although this group is very healing because it gives us hope to continue, praying for the best, but uh, in practical terms, I generally tend um, to see that um, maybe it's not only an esoteric or spiritual agenda, we have to be more, more practical. And uh, one way of doing this, being an educator, is bring all these goals to education in all levels, since um, primary schools to university universities all over the world. Thank you. Uh, Tanya, this is Martha. I hope you heard that you answered your own question when you focused on education. It's so important. 
And uh, may I just extend my condolences on the grievous harm that is taking place in Brazil at the right time. One of the things that helped me when I feel close to atrocity is to not confuse practical with immediate. That the, the 10 points that were brought up today are actually happening. And that the sorrow is, is they're not happening fast enough in the places where people may need it the most. And I have heard people talk about, uh, yeah, when I was in Rio for a short time, though, um, I heard it in the context of what great cultural contribution you're making to Brazil as from the African roots, which the, your section uh, has so much of. And that, too, is a contribution. And so one of the things that is a challenge for me, but I know that it's required of me and probably one of the things that keeps is so important to me as a student in the arcane school is that what I see is very, very limited compared to what humanity sees and that I cannot it begin to grasp the kinds of changes that are occurring in humanity today. And as Maria Christina reminded us, the future is happening right now. So draw hope wherever you can. Be in your own divinity in some ways. I also understand that your foods are absolutely to die for. And so the people that I was with wanted to make sure that I had some food from Baia uh, while I was there. So let me just say that we don't know how it's going to come together, but living in hope, trusting in education, doing every little thing that we can puts us on that bigger ship. Hmm. Yeah, well said, Martha. And I Tanya, thank you. This is Dot again, and I just want to also say thank you for mentioning education. And some of you will recall that uh, months ago, uh, Professor Karen Kangliosi was a speaker talking about open education. Well, she and her colleagues around the world uh, at the university level are starting a project with Wikipedia uh, so that students who are doing the SDG work on the ground through their own research and development with these professors will be then posting on Wikipedia and then making it available through uh, all kinds of distribution networks. So that when that's ready, uh, we'll invite Karen to speak again and, and share about that. And, um, um, oh, sorry. I want to thank you for these remarks. Uh, presently, um, we are working through esoteric education, and uh, we have brought uh, more federation uh, studies and curriculum to Brazil for the past five years. And also uh, the sustainable goals, we have been working in the University of Bahia, which has something like 50,000 uh, students and uh, personnel and teachers and so on. So um, I do have hope, <laughs> that's one reason why I belong to this group, I called it a healing group, but on um, the problem of the Amazon forest, uh, we need to expand this consciousness and um, so that how can we go, <laughs> we are reach the understanding that uh, Gaia is one planet, that we are one humanity, you know, it, uh, it's hard when the educational level of the people is very low. But thank you so much, Martha, and, um, Dot for your comments. Yeah, this is Rebecca. Um, thank you for this conversation. It's really so important. And um, I think it actually intertwines with um, Stacia's question um, because so much of 
uh, what what I see needs to happen anyway, but what I fit, what seems to need to happen with the goals is, uh, and I said this last month, that I feel community needs to really be able to take ownership of them and then to have their voice heard. I don't know how that happens, but education obviously is a really important part of that. Um, but Stacia's question is about the Indigenous Forum and that's another place where this relationship with the earth as a holistic being and the importance of the natural and the way humanity um, interrelates with that is so important. So um, Stacia's asked uh, Martha whether you could elaborate on the Indigenous Forum at the UN. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy Stacia. I just wanted just to say the bit that I know is that around 2004, um, as a result of intense lobbying on the part of indigenous people throughout the world, um, the indigenous people constitute about 4% of the world's population, but when they're broken down into individual countries, in some countries it's 1%, in some countries it's one tenth percent and so on and so forth. And so the um, forum was actually created in order to provide a, a common place, a collective place for all of the indigenous people to express themselves and they are the um, most vocal when it comes to the short-sightedness of destroying forests like the Indonesian forest and the Amazon forest. So it's a fledgling type of thing. Um, and you can Google uh, Indigenous Peoples Forum. They Every year they have uh, an annual event. Uh, I'm guessing it may take place in April, but that uh, you can learn more about the, the, when you when you I when you draw it up on Google, look for a couple of things. How how does they got together? Because it illustrates the kind of uh, coalition building that's happening it, in similar ways as these go, these uh, webinars are uh, pulling together people who are more intensely drawn to certain topics that have to do with transformation. And um, the second thing is to um, look into those indigenous people who are becoming experts. Um, in the United States, for example, there is um, developing a really smart group of indigenous lawyers who are finding and developing approaches to challenging effectively uh, and just this is what most needed. Uh, maybe uh, Maria Christina or James have more to say on this. We just lost you for a minute um, as you were completing that after you'd started. <laughs> I was trying to turn it over to someone else. I am uh, so okay. apologetic for this. <laughs> so so um, wow. you wanted, yeah. So I can it, a little to the indigenous piece growing up on the borderlands where many tribes have land, native land actually. Their their reservations right here are we're way way out on the um, were way out here in the middle of nowhere. As far as Mexico is concerned, you see the main predominant bloodline is indeed indigenous. 
with French, Spanish, Irish blood, but very indigenous and the sacredness of the earth is the sacred trust that indigenous folks have held in trust for us and transforming into the ecological movement of today you know it's it's no longer out in the field and interestingly in mexico speaking of catholicism a very large um organization and you know with good and bad just like everything else um the Virgin in Mexico is actually the predominant icon, I would say, the Lady of Guadalupe. Certainly reigns um, equal in prayer and intention to the masculine aspect. And perhaps she can be considered an aspect of the mother goddess who reigns is is the david kingdom is the david kingdom and that is the feminine kingdom in counterpoint to humanity the masculine kingdom and i think it is important to keep in mind that when we work in tandem with the david to do so from levels you know the higher levels because otherwise we're dealing with uh, lunar petries, with the elementals. And so it is an incredibly unfolding process time that we are in. And this is one aspect of it. I find this beautiful and fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Cristina. We are getting close to the end of the uh, time allocated for our webinar. There's still a raised hand from Sheldon, so I would invite Sheldon to share uh, his impressions and then we will come to the end. Hi, Sheldon. Hello, Alexander. Hello, friends. I, we are out of power here, power outage, so my first time to play with a cell phone, which is immensely difficult. But uh, anyway, I uh, just want to thank everyone for a marvelous presentation. For me, this was one of the most practically inspiring presentations that we've had, bridging all that is going on in the world today, what, what, what can be moving forward. So I just want to say this was that, uh, <laughs> totally inspiring. And I had a question, I think it was James, the, the DK quote, just want to get a reference for where that came from toward the end of the end of the presentation, if that's possible. And if it's not, I'll, I'll look up some things on the, on, the, on the web. But thank you all, wonderful, wonderful work. Um, I, I I don't think I was the uh, the author of that. Was that you, Martha, who pr produced that DK quote? Oh, I'll send it to you, Sheldon. <laughs> I don't have the text in front of me. I'll I'll send it. Okay, good. Well, that's all I need to know. Thank you, Martha. And uh, it's in cosmic yeah. fire. I know that. Okay, good. That's helpful. Good place to start. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Thanks everyone uh, for this really uh, potent conversation and visualization of the sustainable cities and communities of the future. And uh, we'll continue our work uh, moving forward. And as we end our work today, I want to invite you to join our coming webinars. And uh, in the next cycle the cycle of sagittarius we will work with the goal 15 life on land and please if possible add to your meditation daily meditation focus on this goal and uh, we will get together on november 29th to share and reflect together and meditate to strengthen the thought form behind this goal on november 29th and also, please join our coming full moon webinars. On November 10th, we will continue our work bringing together groups from three countries, US, UK, and Russia. This time, it will be the Tetrada group from Russia. And on November 11th, 
please join our solar festival webinar with Helen Franklin and on the energy of Scorpio we and the energy of the fixed cross we bring our communities attention to topics related to discipleship and group work and the topic will be purification of own nature kneeling with hybrid Thanks everyone. Please let's we'll be connected and onward and upward. So as we once again unite our hearts across distance, we stand as a planetary server within the consciousness of Gaia aware of bridging north, south, east, west, above, below, as we stand with the Christ in the fire of love to the glory of the One. Oh.